Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television. For months, Iowa's Capitol building has been relatively quiet, but this week that's changing with a new legislative session convening here in the House of Representatives chambers at the Iowa State House. Members of the House and Senate now in joint session, awaiting Governor Terry Branstad's 2015 Condition of the State Address. Hello, I'm Dean Borg. Governor Branstad, very familiar with this chamber, first serving here as a representative from Winnebago County, and as governor, delivering more of these speeches than any other governor during five terms. Today's speech comes during the week beginning his historic sixth term, and as he perhaps looks to cement a legacy. His expected agenda during this legislative session, Infrastructure and roads will be listening for the governor's ideas for generating revenue for road repairs, maybe hiking fuel taxes, broadband access, Governor Branstad's re-election campaign calling it Connect Every Acre, and legislature also crafting a new state budget with the governor's guidance that'll be tight, past commitments to reducing taxes and spending more on education, now squeezing what's left for new initiatives. And you see now, the Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds being escorted in. <laughs> Members of the House and Senate convened here in joint session, standing as Chris Branstad awaits at the door to be escorted in and introduced. The chair recognizes the Sergeant at Arms. Madam President, the First Lady Chris Branstad, Eric, Adrienne, and Mackenzie Branstead and Marcus and Nicole Branstead and Mark and Beverly Whaley have arrived in the House Chambers. Please escort Governor Branstead's family and guests to their seats. The governor's wife and grandchildren and son also are now being escorted in. The Iowa Executive Council has already been seated. That's Secretary of State Republican Paul Pate, Treasurer Mike Fitzgerald, Secretary of Agriculture Bill Northey, and State Auditor Mary Mossman, and Attorney General Democrat Tom Miller. The governor is now poised at the door. The chair recognizes the Sergeant at Arms. President, your committee to notify and escort Governor Branstead has arrived. Please, uh, the committee will escort the Honorable Terry E. Branstead to the rostrum. We expect that Governor Branstad's speech today will be running just right at about a half an hour. Of course, that can be lengthened by the times he gets applause. He now is walking to the rostrum and he'll be introduced by the president of the Iowa Senate, which is convened here in the House Chambers along with the House of Representatives. That's Pam Yoakum of Dubuque. You'll hear her next. It is my pleasure to introduce the governor of the great state of Iowa to deliver the State of the State Address. Please welcome Governor Branstad. Thank you very much. Madam Lieutenant Governor, Madam President, Mr. Speaker, leaders, justices and judges, legislators, elected officials, distinguished guests, friends, family, fellow Iowans, good morning. It is my honor to stand before you today in this great chamber in front of this joint session of the Iowa Legislature to deliver the message, the condition of Iowa 
is strong. Our strength, our strength comes from working together and our joint commitment to prudent choices for a better Iowa. To the new members of the Iowa legislature who are coming to Des Moines for the first time to serve their constituents back home, welcome. I also want to welcome returning legislators who return to the Capitol after receiving a vote of confidence from your constituents. I'm eager to continue working with you to serve our state. As we return for another legislative session, we return without a military veteran and dedicated public servant, Representative Duane Alonz, who will be dearly missed in this great chamber. I know now more than ever that the work we do here together matters. It matters in the lives of hardworking Iowa families and our Main Street business. It matters to farmers and farmland. It matters to public safety in our state parks. It matters to Iowa children, counting on us to give them a world-class education, who are now benefiting from the phase-in of the most extensive teacher leadership system in the nation. It matters to the veteran completing their tour of duty Instead of worrying about where they're going to find a career after leaving the service, they're comforted to know that Iowa has thousands of careers available for them right here now because of home base Iowa. It matters to the hardworking machinists on the line. Rather than thinking that industry had given up on them, they're eager to the opportunity to sharpen their craft and demonstrate their skills through a National Career Readiness Certificate. It matters that we work together. These successes should serve as guideposts for a, these successes should serve as guideposts for a familiar journey of coming together to help Iowans create more jobs, live better lives, and grow prosperity throughout our state. Ladies and gentlemen, our work together has Iowa on the rise. In the past four years, 180, in the past four years, 168,700 jobs have been created. Iowa's unemployment rate has been slashed by nearly 30 percent, and over nine billion in private capital investments have located in Iowa. We passed the largest tax cut in our state's history, which through a close collaboration of the Iowa Department of Revenue and county governments is being implemented throughout the state. We invested historically in our children's future through transformational education reform. And we did it working together. Together. During the 2014 legislative session, we worked across partisan lines to pass historic home base Iowa package that attracts veterans leaving the military service to come to Iowa to fill high quality careers available here. Our actions are working. Today, over 600 veterans have been matched with jobs in Iowa through Home-Based Iowa Initiative. Eight cities and counties have become Home-Based Iowa communities, standing ready to embrace veterans and their families as they, as they transition to civilian life. And eight of our college and universities have earned the distinction of Home-Based Iowa champs for their designation as, and for the commitment they've made to welcoming service members to their campus. Already our work together has resulted in 24,000 jobs being posted on the Home Base Iowa Jobs Bank. Our work to pass Home Base Iowa is bringing new business to the state as well. This month I met with one of the owners of Capital Armament Company, a former United States Marine he informed me that the company is relocating from Minnesota to Sibley, Iowa, in part because of home base Iowa and the friendly business climate that we offer. <laughs> Simply put, working together, 
We've ensured that veterans leaving the service have boundless opportunities to live, work, and prosper in Iowa. Our work demonstrates that no veteran should have to worry about finding a job after sacrificing so much for our state and our nation. Our work through the Iowa Apprenticeship and Job Training Program, the Skilled Iowa Initiative, and the National Career Readiness Certificate, among other initiatives, helped hardworking Iowans move forward. Unlike past years, when tuition was raised by over 17 percent, we worked together to pass a tuition freeze for Iowa students at our region's institutions. Our work has put us on a bright, sustainable path. Our budget is balanced. Our state maintains a budget surplus. Our economic emergency accounts are fully funded, and our unemployment rate is the 10th lowest in the nation. And we've done it together. <laughs> With our continued progress, we must continue to be mindful of the prudent budgeting that brought us the opportunity to reinvest in our children and to return taxpayers' hard-earned money. Through careful management, we can continue to grow even if we encounter some choppy waters. We must continue following the lead of our fellow Iowans. Like the nearly 40 farmers who came together in Northwest Iowa last October, with eight combines and six dump carts and a dozen trucks to help harvest the beans of a fallen friend. The message that rings out today and always in Iowa, together we can. Together we can make our schools safer. We can continue implementing transformational education reform while passing new measures to protect our students from bullying and harassment in schools. Together, we can strengthen our rural infrastructure by connecting every acre in Iowa to high-speed internet. Better access to broadband means ensuring modern farming methods can flourish in all Iowa fields as part of a modern infrastructure. Strengthening our infrastructure also means we must come together and strengthen the roads and bridges that connect Iowa farmers, schools, and Main Street businesses to the world. We can make college more affordable and accessible for Iowans. We can renew our commitment to providing affordable, world-class education at our region's universities by offering select degrees for $10,000 and again freezing tuition for Iowa students. We can provide more assistance to Iowa students with financial needs attending our outstanding independent colleges and universities. Let's continue to invest in our community colleges, including skilled training for Iowa workers. A better trained workforce means better opportunities for Iowa families. Simply put, no position in our state should be left unfilled due to lack of skilled workers. Together, we can make Iowa the most transparent government in the land. We can offer Iowa taxpayers a new transparency portal, making state government more open, accessible, and easier to navigate. Together, we can accomplish this forward-thinking plan of action. We have these opportunities to improve the quality of life in our state because together, we made it possible. In the fall of 2014, Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds, my wife Chris and I had the opportunity to visit Sioux City, North Linn, and Marshalltown school districts to discuss the important topic of preventing bullying in Iowa schools. We were pleased to be joined at each stop by students, teachers, parents, school administrators, legislators, and community leaders. What we heard at each school was clear. Students are ready to stand up and say, let's end bullying in Iowa. Now it's our turn. Students in these districts and throughout our state have told their stories of learning being disrupted and feeling unsafe. 
What's worse, we know some students are even being physically and emotionally harmed. Community leaders and parents shared that it is time for the state to act. I agree. Every day, children in Iowa schools are tormented by bullies. Bullies attack at school and, in, and on the internet. They lurk not just in the corners of the schoolhouse, but also on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Yik Yak, and through text messaging. Iowa common sense tells us that every child in Iowa deserves to go to school each and every day in a safe and respectful learning environment. They deserve a classroom and a community that allows them to grow and flourish not live in fear of when the bully will strike again. This is the year that we stand up to the bully. We can't wait any longer. Please join Lieutenant Governor Reynolds, my wife Chris, and me in standing up against bullying. Together we can end bullying in Iowa. Together we can protect our students at our schools from bullies. The Bully Free Act of 2015 that I propose today gives parents more information by requiring parental notification. However, I'm also proposing an extra layer of protection for students. This year's anti-bullying legislation allows an exception from notification if a bullied student and a school official believe that Parental notification could lead to abuse, neglect, or rejection. Legislation also launches a bullying prevention program by empowering student mentors to take ownership of anti-bullying efforts in their schools. The bill allows a student who changes schools due to bullying to immediately participate in athletics. The legislation will also provide investigator training for schools. Together, we can make 2015 the year that Iowa acted to protect our children and grandchildren by ending bullying in our schools. <laughs> Moving Iowa forward also means ensuring our schools and communities stay safe and our families feel protected. It means we must do more to protect victims of domestic abuse. Now, domestic abusers can serve only a fraction of their sentence and return to demonizing their victims. This is wrong. It is wrong for the victims, and it's the wrong policy for the safety and well-being of Iowans. Let's work together to pass additional measures ensuring that victims do not live in fear of their abuser returning from prison long before the sentence is completed. Today, I propose legislation classifying anyone convicted of domestic abuse three times as a habitual offender. This classification would triple the mandatory minimum sentence. The legislation holds criminals accountable for their abuse, allows them ample time to rehabilitate, and protects our communities. While victims and communities will be protected from habitual offenders, together we can protect vulnerable Iowans from individuals making criminal threats. Oftentimes, Iowa courts order a threatening individual to stay away from a potential victim, but should the order be violated, the victim and the authorities are not notified until after the fact, and sometimes that's too late. Together, we can give authorities, authorities and the victims the power of knowing when abuser is in close proximity. Together, we can enact legislation that expands the use of GPS monitoring on dangerous domestic abusers. Together we can protect victims of domestic violence. Together we can end bullying in Iowa.
We know our budget is sound and that our books are balanced. We've done this together. We passed historic tax relief, aiding Main Street businesses, and we passed measures to increase the skills of Iowa workers. Those measures helped attract great companies, creating high-quality careers to Iowa all over our state. Facebook just finished its first Iowa data center in Altoona and is already working on an expansion. Google is growing in Council Bluffs again, and Microsoft is expanding in West Des Moines. Cargill and CJ just opened in Fort Dodge and are bringing even more good jobs to the region. In Sioux City, CF Industries will be expanding production of nitrogen fertilizer for Iowa farmers. The Iowa fertilizer plant under construction in Lee County will produce both nitrogen fertilizer and DEF to reduce pollution and increase mileage for diesel engines. Valent Biosciences, Kenzie, Kemen, Sabre, Brownells, and Mid-America's Historic Wind Project are all growing right here in Iowa. Across our state, though, farming operations still provide the lifeblood of our economy. This continued success depends, and their continued success depends on their ability to connect. Not only to connect their equipment to the ground, but in this day and age, it means connecting their equipment to the internet, connecting with the global marketplace to sell their goods, connecting to main streets across Iowa. The fabric of our state is woven together by the gravel roads and interstate highways. But in this day and age, it must also be connected through access to broadband as well. This legislative session, let's come together and pass legislation allowing rural Iowa to experience continued growth and connection to the rest of Iowa and the rest of the world. Together, let's put partisan politics aside and give rural Iowa the broadband legislation that connects every acre and connects communities to the careers of the 21st century. Our Connect Every Acre plan focuses on providing more broadband in rural Iowa and encourages service providers to build out networks, not just to the ending point, but to the rural communities in between, between Davenport and Des Moines, between Mason City and Sioux City, and all across Iowa. We are enriched by many fine rural communities. Let's weave them together with the fiber of high-speed internet connecting every acre and covering our state with broadband internet. We can accomplish this together by focusing on increasing access through reasonable regulation and encouraging growth, and by fostering expansion by creating the Iowa Farms, Schools, and Communities Broadband Grant Program. Adopting these measures demonstrates an ongoing commitment to our state's continued growth. With some of the most fertile land in the world, Citizens with exceptional work ethic and a strong sense of community pride, rural Iowa has boundless opportunities. Together, we can adopt measures to connect every acre and give them yet another reason to believe their best days are ahead. Building a better Iowa means building Iowa for the future. It means investing in our state's infrastructure. So let's invest in broadband internet, and let's also invest in Iowa's roads and bridges. Over the past few years, rhetoric has trumpeted results when it comes to action on infrastructure funding for Iowa. A recently completed Battelle study demonstrates the need for us to take a hard look at adequate road funding. The study shows that without action, funding available for road and bridge maintenance will fall short of what is needed to remain competitive and, most importantly, safe. Without action, Iowa's roads and bridges face 
and uncertain future, our farmers will find it more difficult to deliver their commodities to market. Business and industry will look elsewhere when considering where to invest and grow. As the study found, sound infrastructure remains a prerequisite for economic development. This is our opportunity to pave the road to Iowa's strong future. Together we can find common ground and pass a bipartisan plan to fund the systems critical to our state's vitality, Iowa's roads and bridges, and our broadband infrastructure. Building an infrastructure as strong as the future that we want Iowa must be a bipartisan priority this legislative session. I'm confident we can find a solution together. We Iowans always do. Iowans' exceptional work ethic, commitment and dedication are recognized across the country and around the world. Yet within our state today, skilled job openings are abundantly available and going on filled. Last October, I toured Omaha Standard Paul Finger in Council Bluffs. They are an international company that produces hoists, service cranes, and lift gates and more. The Council Bluffs manufacturing facility was buzzing on the day I visited. Production floor was filled with welders and machinists. I saw their passion for their trade and their commitment to a superior product. For years, lift gates and service cranes have been produced overseas. Now they're being manufactured in America. They're being produced in Council Bluffs, Iowa. After our tour, company leaders shared with me they are eager to hire more workers in Council Bluffs if only they could find those that had the right skills. These are long-term, high-paying careers for Iowans, and they should not be left open. Together, we can establish the Center for Human Capital Enrichment, a public-private partnership dedicated to aligning education and job training program for workers. With a stronger workforce in place, we'll bring more manufacturing and high-skilled jobs to our state. Let's lift up the Iowa worker. We can help companies like Omaha Standard Paulfinger who are ready to expand and fill more jobs in the state of Iowa. Our state budget is tight. That is no secret. Iowans rightly expect predictability and stability in state government, but they also expect our state budget to reflect their priorities. The biennial budget that I propose today is balanced, works within our five-year projections, and still freezes tuition for Iowa students at our state universities for the third straight year. Raising tuition for the third consecutive years is a bold step to provide an affordable higher education in Iowa, but our path doesn't end there. That's why we challenged the State Board of Regents to develop a plan that offers students a set of degrees that they can earn for $10,000. In addition, I'm offering legislation to create the Iowa Student Debt Reorganization Tax Credit. This tax credit allows individuals to volunteer for worthy causes in exchange for having contributions made toward their student debt. We've worked together to freeze tuition. Now let's continue to take the right steps to make Iowa a leader in reducing student debt. Iowans rightly expect high quality for the money they spend on education, as well as a government that reflects their shared values. Together, we work to increase transparency in government making it as open and honest as the people of our great state. We created the Iowa Public Information Board to give the public a resource when seeking information from local and state government. I'm pleased to report that the Iowa Public Information Board has responded to 643 cases 
in the past fiscal year. More and more, the inquiries are not complaints, but rather questions from policymakers about how they can be more transparent. The Iowa Public Information Board is making every layer of government more open. This year, I'm recommending that Iowa establish a government accountability portal, a one-stop shop for citizens seeking information. The portal, housed within the Public Information Board, will field requests and respond within one business day as state employees. We are here to serve the taxpayers. Iowa can do more to improve government transparency. For many years, the people of Iowa who fund state government have been kept in the dark on personnel decisions because of a loophole in Iowa's open records law. I was pleased last year when the House of Representatives passed on a bipartisan basis legislation that would shine light on these personnel files. A substantiated offense while a government employee is being paid by the taxpayers should not be hidden in the shadows. Together, in the best interests of Iowa taxpayers, we can shine light on these records and make our state government even more open, honest, and transparent. As I travel the state, I marvel at the endless beauty of our landscape. When I visit all 99 counties, I never, I never cease to be amazed of what local communities are doing to continually improve on their main streets and quality of life. From the High Trestle Trail Bridge near Madrid to the revitalization of downtown Cedar Rapids, from the Lewis and Clark Estate a park near the banks of the Missouri River to the historic Millwork District in Dubuque near the Mississippi River. Our land between two rivers offers our citizens a high quality of life and our visitors many attractions. But as Lieutenant Governor Reynolds and I continue to work to bring more business and industry to our state, we hear that companies are interested not only in our welcoming business climate, but also in a high quality of life for their employees. This year, I'm proposing Iowa Next, a holistic plan for quality of life initiatives across the state. Let's bring together state agencies that have a shared interest in quality of life initiatives and invest in our parks, trails, lakes, and museums. The proposals outlined today will impact every Iowan. They will help to create jobs, protect students and families, and open up our government. Like the old saying goes, many hands make light work. Remember back in June of last year, torrential rains pummeled Northwest Iowa. In the Sioux County town of Rock Valley, the Rock River surged over its banks and into the streets and homes of residents. A few short weeks before Ragbri, Citizens and community leaders were wondering if they'd be able to recover. When I arrived in Rock Valley, I had little doubt. In a town of just 3,500 people, 1,700 people showed up to help sandbag. Members of the town helped evacuate a local assisted living home. Emergency managers stayed up throughout the night to ensure the safety and well-being of locals, their homes, and the town's infrastructure. And when the cycles of ragbri from around the globe arrived in Rock Valley, the city was ready because they worked together. When a challenge arrives, we Iowans get to work. We know that by working together, we can find a solution to any problem. The 86th General Assembly is upon us. With it comes an opportunity. Working together and moving forward is the Iowa way. Let's come together again and make our schools stronger and safer, our communities more connected, our families better protected, our workers better trained, our universities more affordable, and our government the most transparent in the United States. Now's the time to get to work.
Now's the time to get to work. Together we can build a better Iowa. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless all the people of the great state of Iowa. Thank you very much. Well, that last line of the governor's is like revelry in the military. Let's get to work. He's like the bugle. And he got a standing ovation for that. Governor Branstad still at the podium. Members of the General Assembly in joint session now on their feet, along with those who are guests and in the well in front of the rostrum. That's Pam Yoakum now. Will the committee please come forward and escort Governor Branstad and his family and guests from the House chamber? She's the president of the Iowa Senate, and she's, uh, this is part of the pop and ceremony that is uh, the committee that was appointed by the joint session of the Iowa legislature to escort the governor from his offices, one floor below this chamber. Now, escorting the back. The governor now passing among the Supreme Court justices, the Iowa Supreme Court and Chief Justice Mark Cady, the Iowa Court of Appeals, nine judges here, walking through the chamber now and shaking hands with some of the guests as he exits. That's Chris Branstead uh, standing and uh, gets a, a quick kiss from her husband as he passes by. That's Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds embracing the governor. The overall theme, together we can, stressing past achievements of the legislature and the governor working together, and the governor saying we can do it again, outlining several things that he thinks the legislature can do, and probably omitting some things that some people would like to have heard him mention. With me right now is Senate Majority Leader, and then the leader of the Democrats, the majority in the Senate, Mike Gronstall of Council Bluffs. And uh, Senator Gronstall, I just mentioned, uh, maybe some people would like to have heard some things that they didn't hear in this address. Where does that fall for you? I, well, here's, here's what I'd say. I, uh, what Senate Democrats are talking about is the folks that have been left out in the economy, the middle class, uh, people on the bottom economic rung of the ladder. That's, that's, that's what our focus is going to be about um, in this legislative session is growing the middle class. Well, did you many, of the, today? many of the governor's ideas um, will help uh, grow a middle class. We think, we think what, broadband, what, what? we think his uh, initiative on, uh, on anti-bullying, those are both tough, complicated issues, but things that we care about. Uh, but what I see lacking is, is, uh, is a middle class initiative that's really going to grow. And that's, that's the prism that Senate Democrats are going to look through on every proposal. Does this help grow a middle class? Uh, you know, the stock market's up. Uh, farmland values are up, um, uh, profits are up for, uh, for, for companies. Everything's up except one thing in our economy, and that's wages. And so we, we really think we need to work on things that will help grow family wages. Um, a tuition freeze will certainly help in that area, make it, make it easier. Efforts to improve training programs and, and, and more access to uh, training programs so workers can get a ticket to a better life. Those are things that will help grow the middle class. Mm -hmm. That's the prism that Senate Democrats look at his proposals through and kind of everything that comes before us. You know, the year. broadband in the last session failed to pass. What you're saying is that is a key to growing the middle class. I think we, uh, yeah, I, I do think broadband is part of having um, a healthy economy. In so state. you think so. that might sail through this session? I, um, it's a complicated. Uh, uh, I sail through. Sail through might be it might be an overstatement, um, but it's a because it's a very complicated issue. What we want to do. What's complicated uh, about it? Well, how do you uh, how do you incent behavior that will that will create better access um, to to broadband um, uh, uh, information services? How do you how do you how do you incent something 
You can just give money away to people and hope it has an impact, or you can target, um, target your incentives in a way where you're sure it will actually incent new behavior. There well, are one places of the incentives, uh, you had a briefing this morning too, as journalists did, I'm sure, and you know that one of the incentives is to uh, property tax abatement on broadband and, and, initiatives, and, uh, retroactive to maybe July of uh, 2014. And we think, I, we, we, think uh, we can work with uh, local communities but it's it's a little um, it's 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 a little disingenuous to say we think there needs to be more broadband so you local cities have to give up some revenue to get it I see um, so that's the part where we want to work with the cities um, I think cities are willing to come to the table on that front and and so we're going to reach out but that's what makes it complicated it also makes it complicated in sending a business to provide to invest more if they were already going to invest it, um, you're just kind of throwing money away and not actually making much of a difference. You have said before the speech that education was a prime component of the Democrats' legislative agenda. Did you hear what you wanted to hear on education? That's why I heard the $10,000 possible degree at Regents I, Institutions. I, I, th I think that sounds like, but a, what about like K a very 12? interesting idea. On K-12, I think the governor's saying the right things. But over the last four years, we have fallen. We have fallen from probably the high 20s in terms of per pupil um, support to 37th in the country in terms of per pupil support. It's, uh, the rhetoric is good, the governor's heart's in the right place, uh, but we've got to see what his budget is to see if, see if the budget matches um, his words. And Dave Roeder, the director of management and budget, told political journalists this morning in the briefing, we have to be extremely careful in spending uh, because we past commitments have extremely limited what we have and we're going to be in trouble if we spend too much. And we completely agree with that, but the other thing we've said over the years is K-12 education, that first ticket to a better life for our children, it has to be our first and best priority. So that's um, uh, that's what we've got to make sure that we're going to invest in our in our children's future. And as I said, we have fallen from somewhere in the high 20s to to 37th in the country in terms of our support for K through 12 education. World class schools. Um, it, it's not all about money, but it's certainly part about money. And and you can't expect world class results with. 37th in the, in the country support. What is the single thing that you heard this morning that you were on your feet applauding and you think is going to be very popular in this uh, session? Uh, you know, I, I certainly have a soft, a soft spot in, in my heart for doing something, uh, for continuing to do a great effort with veterans um, and, and help veterans um, recognize our state's a great place to come to after their military careers. So, so I like that. Um, I, and I like the, the commitment to training programs. Uh, my heart, so, you know, when I, when I talk to people that through community college or college degree or whatever have gotten the kind of training that give them, uh, give them a, a living wage, want to raise a family, that's the stuff that, that kind of brings tears to your eyes. I'm not putting words in your mouth, but would you join the governor and say, together we can? Oh, absolutely. Together we can. We've done that. We've done that for the last four years. We have our strong differences in some areas, but together we have and we will. Thank you, Senator okay. Gronstall. Thanks. Well, we'll have Senator Gronstall on Iowa Press along with House Speaker Craig Paulson later this week on statewide Iowa Public Television. This Friday on Iowa Press, we'll be questioning those two from our on-site studio right here at the Iowa State House. That's Iowa Press Friday at 7.30 and Sunday at noon. And then Friday morning at 9, we'll be bringing you this week live coverage of Governor Branstad's historic sixth inaugural. That's on IPTV's World Channel. It'll be live there and online at IPTV.org. And But then rebroadcast Friday night on IPTV at 8.30 Friday night. So for our entire Iowa Public Television crew here at the State Capitol in Des Moines, I'm Dean Borg, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation.
generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.